um, you you mentioned in the the approach that you were taking to construct narratives of the future, and you showed. Uh, please come on stage, Natasha. Um, I'll actually get off stage. <laughs> you. Um, <laughs> you um, you show this 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 wonderful old school cosmo um, cosmism uh, solar punk kind of image on your existential hope slide, uh, painting an image of a very very beautiful future. Um, what so I'm wondering about the approach that you're taking. So how to build these narratives, and what do you do with the narratives once they're constructed? So maybe you can tell a bit more about what you do in this world building uh, workshop, and then how do you, uh, what do you do with the results that come out of there? How do you get them into the world? Yeah, like I said, I think it's uh, very much an experiment for us still. Um, but with the world building, the idea is to, uh, yeah, get get different minded um, people to to build out these worlds um, so that they can be. Uh, both more detailed than most of what's out there, um, but also that they can be um, good to use as pathways. Like one of the thing that, things that we're going to try to do with it is uh, once they actually have their idea of what they want the world to be, we're going to throw like a random challenge at them, like a surprise uh, challenge that they have to like then, oh, well, how do we deal with this? Like, how do we deal with this pandemic um, to make the world a bit more robust? Um, and then um, that hopefully by having these these worlds, the idea is to like then backtrack and maybe be able to like reverse engineer the path to get there. So you have uh, a bit of a timeline. Obviously, we're not going to get it uh, completely correct, but it can be useful to just have like you know like a north star. Uh, and then uh, longer term, well, to promote these worlds, hopefully they're like uh, exciting enough to get people excited about these types of futures. So. Um, that means like doing the podcast episodes and just putting more of the content out there. And longer term, I really, really hope that we could see, I think that's every time I talk about existential hope at first sight, um, especially the older people, <laughs> they always say that we need more positive popular culture. Um, and I think they often refer to like, uh, Christine, one of our co-founders always refers to like, um, when she grew up, there were like all these exciting visions for the future. She was doing like sci-fi that she was getting excited about the future for. Uh, and I think that if we could do like modern versions of that with these worlds, that would be really nice. Uh, yeah, I, I like to also link up this with your talk uh, because I think one reason many of the anti-transhumanist movements right now that you were mentioning in the last slide are somewhat strong is that they actually have a vision for the future. It's the past. It's sometimes the medieval past, but whoa, they have actually a kind of vision. Uh, because one of the problems I think we have in a liberal Western society now is that we don't like bringing up future visions because if I say I want this, some of you will not want it. And then we have a disagreement and that's awkward. So let's agree to reduce risks. That's kind of the only thing we can agree on. And then we end up with a very bland, uninspiring future that doesn't hang together. If you go out and actually argue for a positive vision, some people will say, I don't want that one. But actually, it's way more compelling if you give real visions. And I think this is something where we actually need to uh, straighten our backs and actually start daring to come up with these visions, even if it means that some people, even our friends, are saying, no, actually, I don't want to live in your utopia. That's kind of fine. But it's rather that we should have these utopias, because that's the way of fighting against the reactionary ones. I think if we take a pause, and just look back a couple of decades at all the visionary ideas uh, presented not only in writing narratives, but also, I mean, Max Moore's letter to Mother Nature was beautifully written. And take a look at some of the futurist scenarios. As futurists, that's what we do. We create scenarios for preferred futures with an S on the end. 
And these scenarios are lovely. And I think that what we need to do is to, to do a little research and go back and take a look at them. And they're still being written today by many futurists about all sorts of plausible and possible futures, namely Peter Demandis. I mean, he hasn't been mentioned today. His work is phenomenal when looking at the positive futures. And you say hope, I say opportunity for the future. So. I think we just need to spread our wings and take a look at what we've got today. Also, and lastly, in the field of games, there's some beautiful stories. Some of them are based on war and fighting, but a lot of them aren't. So we need to dig into that um, beautiful expose of arts. Uh, I am actually curious uh, about uh, existential risks of uh, implementing existential risks ideas because often uh, really like smart and good ideas about like AI safety and existential safety, uh, they are often misused, they are used for regulatory capture and also uh, sometimes people even try to implement it but because of human and organizational reasons, uh, you will got re way more uh, dangerous problems than just ignoring them. And I think that uh, it's, uh, for example, AI safety, it lost a lot of credibility after open AI drama when, uh, so now there is even a meme with Ilya Saskaver, you know, he wanted to, he was the organizer of firing Sam Altman and then he said, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't predict consequences of uh, my actions and then there was a meme with him like, people who want to safeguard uh, artificial general uh, intelligence uh, cannot predict consequences uh, of their actions three days in advance. Yeah. So how would you address such risks? Well, the obvious way of not doing it is to say, well, le let's not do it. Let's not try to fix these risks, but it's going to work out. That is exceedingly stupid and has not worked in many domains. In many domains, some risks do get worked out, but especially when it's the really sharp ones, it's better to think in ahead. So imagine if we had started OpenAI just for profit, and now it's starting on, and now we realize, oh, oh, it's actually getting quite dangerous. Can we now put in a board to regulate it? What probability do you think we would have at, at that point to do so? But it failed. That's sad. And it uh, kind of shows that there are very limits on this form of government. But it doesn't show that it's a stupid idea to try to handle x risk In particular, saying, oh, AI safety is being used for regulatory capture. Sure, some people are doing it. But it's also because it's darn dangerous. You could say that we have regulatory capture because of in the, in the nuclear industry. But actually, nuclear reactors blowing up are bad. That doesn't mean we should say, yeah, let's fix those risks once we build the reactor. Once it's up and running, we're going to learn so many things about plutonium. Then we can figure out how to keep it contained. Well, that's not going to work. So the problem is you want to balance this. And that is where you want a wide, rather diverse debate about it. I'd just like to add, and I think you might be interested in this, beneficial artificial general intelligence conference is happening in Panama City, Panama, in a couple of weeks, some of us will be there. And um, we're going to be looking at the highly creative vision for the future with AI while looking at the risks, but also looking at the benefits. So it's very important to balance that out and to apply critical thinking and creative thinking. James Hughes has a question. He's had his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is inspired by Chris's comments. Um, I think for me, one of the things, the, the two aspects of transhumanism's influence in the world that I've been puzzled by, and why we haven't been more influential, more overlap with these movements. First, Chris's comments that uh, collectivism was the origin of, or was bound up with the ideas of transhumanism originally. I would paint a different historical picture saying that liberal individualism has been central to, you know, since the Enlightenment at any rate, the liberal individualism has been central. And as a consequence, the um, rise of fascism in the last 10 years around the world, um, I've been surprised that we our, our response, that the transhumanist response to fascism has been more muted. And I think that partly has to do with the fact that 
we need more reflection about why some transhumanist prominent transhumanist figures like peter thiel became supporters of fascism and what that means and related to that one of the through lines of fascism around the world has been opposition to reproductive rights opposition to lgbt rights and opposition to trans people in particular um and for me trans people are like the shock troops of transhumanism people who want to use technology to transform their bodies and with few exceptions like martine rothblatt who's written ex exclusively or written about this in the past um we haven't had much trans people arguing that they're a part of a transhumanist project or transhumanist people arguing that trans people are part of the transhumanist project more it's more of an effort to kind of separate the two usually so i'm just puzzled why we haven't had more influence and i think it does relate to the fact that we have been male dominated up to this point and, and that we hopefully will become more diverse in the future just any reflections along those lines would be interesting did you want to reflect on that there's a, oh, okay. Martin Rothblatt's book is The Apartheid of Sex. It's an exceptional book. And of course she's trans, but there are a lot of trans within the transhumanist movement. The decision not to promote that is because it's political. And many of us would rather stay away from that while on our board of directors at Humanity Plus, which is the largest transhumanist organization, which um, James Hughes uh, was the executive director of for many years. We have lots of trends. It's not hiding it. It's not not paying attention to it. We are. It's that there are other things that we have to do. We have someone and um, a new person who ran for the board of directors, and she runs the largest trans group in the world, and I'm working with her on that. But we don't want to just focus on that. I mean, it, because that trans gets over, and transhumanism has been obfuscated to be about trans gender and it's not transhumanism is bigger than that it's a vital part of it to be sure but it's not just about it so i think that something is missing there and i wouldn't call peter Thiel a fascist come on i mean you know that was kind of undercutting i just um maybe um so the point is when i said collectivism i mean what i mean is collectivism if you refer to humanity i would already call this a collectivism and what we've seen um, i think uh, i learned in many art science interaction recently that it's very good in science to also talk about emotions cultural shape how, how one is cultural shaped etc and so transhumanism is very science focused and I, I think we should think a little bit about uh, solarpunk was mentioned, but I think my generation at least was very much shaped by cyberpunk. And cyberpunk is basically, uh, our world now is very similar to these cyberpunk scenarios. That's an individualism which is, which is uh, sad. <laughs> it's, uh, today it's even worse to some extent because it's all this nationalism, etc. also comes into it. So what I mean is, uh, maybe you know in The Great Dictator at the very end uh, this speech, and here you see a total individual, uh, a human being, but of course, what does this individual refers to? To humanity, to the common cause. And this is what I mean by collectivism. And this is something which I still hold on in all my old critiques of, um, of the transhumanist movement. It's too much shaped by a very narrow notion of individualism, which is, uh, as we now can see, easily falls prey to social Darwinism, and thereby I would call it fascism, but uh, you can also oh, choose so another term. <laughs> absolutely not. Let's, let's, uh, Anders, just a uh, I'm sorry, well, I'll get it back. Well, it's yeah. So no, well, I think pinning down whatever Peter Thiel thinks is in itself not the important thing. But he actually did say something very interesting at the Singularity Summit in 2012. He was giving a talk about why aren't we seeing enough progress. He was complaining that the curves were not accelerating as they should and pointed out if that doesn't happen, we stagnate economically. What happens when, to the populations when they stagnate economically? Well, they go communist in poorer countries and they go fascist in richer countries. And I assume he then did the math and realized he wanted to own at least part of the fascist infrastructure, um, which is at the very, very least, it might not be moral, but might be good business. Uh, the real problem, I think, is that uh, 
yeah, uh, I think we have uh, this fear of a culture war. And uh, like Natasha said, don't make uh, the trans people too central to transhumans. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I think the problem is in the US, people get so obsessed about the trans question. I'm just thinking about the next one after. I'm totally going to write the Morphological Freedom book because I know that once the trans question is settled, the furry question is going to come. Uh, uh, tales are going to be way more hardcore than the, uh, the gender toilets. Um, and I think we should just recognize, yeah, there are going to be some super controversial questions and we need to manage that sensibly as organizations. But as a movement, as people who want to do the right thing, I think we should actually embrace those varieties of humanity that we like and think they are great examples of what we're all about. You might not like them, but they, I do, because they're actually part of this vanguard for the future. I think that's very important. And that might sometimes mean that we're going to be yelling at each other because it might be politically problematic. But so be it. <laughs> well, I'd rather we yell at each other than name call. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about like in terms of uh, how people get engaged with these ideas today. Um, and I was thinking about my own, like from a personal reflection then, uh, how I came to engage with transhumanism going to this conference day is more like I got involved with effective altruism because effective altruism is just way, way broader, it's out there, like that's, um, I found effect, effective altruism when I was at university, that's what led me to work at Foresight Institute. At Foresight I started hearing about like transhumanists and, and these sort of things and that's what led me to, to where I am today, so I think it's, um, it's also just a question of like the, the funnel in, kind of. Hi, so um, I want to address the question that was raised by you earlier and I also want to tie it into the idea about collectivism and this discussion about it. So, um, and I would like to know what you think about it. So I think why we are now in this kind of, um, in this space, in the mental space where there's mostly dystopias, I think it's not only about that we don't have enough ideas or that we're not we're, uh, communicating them, but it's of course also um, a function of the society that we're in. So I think um, you can think of Marx, whatever you want, and maybe I'll try to kind of uh, defend some of his ideas in the lightning talk, but one of his insights or one of his thesis was that being determines consciousness. And this means that it's not only, it's not our ideas that determine the progress of society, but it's kind of the, there are like path dependencies, there's like structural incentives, and they're mostly formed by economics. Because people have to work for a living, and this already structures most of their lives, and then there's technology which structures the rest of, all their, day, uh, uh, yeah, their every day. And so, those are like the really forming, uh, forming forces of our society and so I think maybe this is gets neglected in transhumanist activism that in order for people to have hope they already need to feel some kind of agency they already need to feel that the society is moving in a direction and as as soon as that happens people start to get greedy and people think maybe we can even you know go to Mars and maybe we can colonize the universe and so on but first they need kind of a better wage, they need you know, more time off, they need all those stuff that has been you know, not provided by them, although the technological means would be there. And uh, one, sec one last thought, so um, I think what we have to get right is that you know, the collectivism that once existed was, it came out of liberalism. It was, you know, communism was not some kind of a, a you know, closely knit, like familiar society. It was a highly individualistic, even more individualistic, because there was no dependency on the employer anymore. What? There was, yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. The idea was it. The idea, of course, what existed it was, of course, terrible. And maybe the idea is impossible. I don't know. But this was the idea, or at least this, this was the genealogy. And now we think yeah. that capital and modernity are the same. Uh, and this no. is also what Nick Land thinks, and maybe, no. maybe this is, empirically it's the case, and I'm not sure if it has to be the case, so we can think about, we, of course we all want to salvage modernity, and the question is, how do we do that, and is capital 
of course, it was the but, most propulsion force, but maybe it's also sometimes a hindering force. So, your point about Marx is empirically wrong. Uh, Marx might have believed it, and I think it's true that actually we do get shaped by the infrastructure. Architecture just sh does shape how we can interact, our technology shaping. But the level of hope in society is not strongly correlated to the actual material situation. A lot of it has to do with the trend. If it actually looks like uh, you're going to get better off in the future, you tend to be hopeful. But even that one is somewhat weakly correlated. Uh, and indeed, you have these funny situations where many societies are surprisingly hopeful even though they're not working very well. However, when they lose hope, things go really badly wrong. We saw that in Eastern Europe, we've seen that today in the United Kingdom and maybe in America. Uh, but I think the important part here is there is an interplay. Again, I think the actor network theory point is in the superseding marks. Uh, there are ways of engaging hope and that bootstraps societies to get better. That is how we got out of the Malthusian trap. It was not just technology, it was society that actually felt like, oh, we should as a collective project improve things, this works. Actually, it didn't work for a long time, but they didn't notice that because we were hopeful. But, uh, sorry, this is probably le best left for a later uh, lightning talk. We can have a lightning talk against each other. <laughs> One thing that we're leaving out is decentralized uh, systems. Um, isn't there a flurry of decentralized, democratized systems going on right now? Humanity Plus, we've created one. It's called the H Plus DAO with trans people, and we're pushing it out. We won the $40,000 grant, not that much money, but we're building the first transhumanized um, decentralized democratic system for building monies to go to different projects in education and building societies. So there are things going on. We just, uh, maybe I should have bragged more about things that we're doing to influence you, but transhumanism certainly isn't something that lacks a vision of the future. It's based on a vision of the future. That's what it is. Someone asked me during the break, why did I become interested in transhumanism? I said, because I wanted to live when I was really ill. She said, it's based on hope. And I said, yeah, hope for a better future. That's what it's all about. But it's not just hope. You can't just hope. You have to do. You have to produce. You have to be active, just like neuroplasticity. Just a comment uh, on this collectivism, individualism thing. So, so in Star Trek and Enterprise, are they collectivists or individualists? I don't think they really care. <laughs> I guess so. I, I think freedom is always, in particular in an advanced uh, civilization, and in particular if we think about going out there where our animal bodies are not really fit to, so will be a highly collectivist enterprise. And the, the question is how, how we can we stick to individual freedom? in such a context. Maybe we have time for one final question. Yeah, I would like to bring a different angle in the, <clears throat> in the discussion. You guys are all, in, like me and a lot of people here, we are scientists, right? What I'm hearing now is that transvision, transhumanism, is a kind of a different angle on healthcare. I'm educated in healthcare deeply in, de in diseases, mental diseases, whatever. Is transhumanism now a different application of science? Is it a different scientific method? Why are we distracting it from healthcare? Like Whereas we are doing the yes. same thing. Well, it's, we live in a, a sick care system. Transhumanism okay. is for a healthcare agree. system. Completely okay. agree. So it's a psychological difference in possibilities. But does that also mean that it is a sci different scientific method? No, I think the key thing is, what is medicine for? Uh, this, this is a big issue in medical ethics, and there are literally bookshelves full of books and papers on how to define disease and illness and what medicine legitimately can do. And transhumanism is saying, there are things that are not in those lists you previously done that we think are legitimate, like treatment of aging, uh, like enhancement, uh, getting a tail if you want it. That's not part of what is currently regarded as a legitimate medicine. Uh, 
Uh, we think, for various reasons, this ought to be in there, and we might want to change the definitions uh, around. And that has been much of a bioethical debate I've been engaging. But it's not a scientific method difference. It's a goal difference. It's a view of the ethics of why this is a good thing, and we ought to be having it. Any last comments from any of the speakers? <coughs> If not, Have fun. Christopher. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful speeches and contributions. Thank you.